Hello again. I am here with Alan Veeley, and in must have been about 2000, I took my first class on American Indian literature uh, that Alan was teaching. And it was uh, right then at that moment that I decided that I wanted to be a professor of American Indian literature. So um, I have Alan to thank for it, uh, not just for that, but uh, for coming and being with us here today. Good to see you, Alan. Good to see you. All right. Uh, you've been at this for a while now. Yes, sir. You showed up here at OU what year? 1967. 1967. <clears throat> And that was uh, when you came in, out of Stanford, is that right? Right. All right. And when you showed up on campus, it wasn't to specialize in American Indian literature. No, it was to teach Shakespeare. Uh-huh. What, um, what brought you to American Indian Lit? Well, if you remember... And if I don't. You, <laughs> well, the 60s were a time of turmoil and student demands, and there had been a demand for uh, by the... African American students for African American studies and literature and so forth. And so the uh, OU had quite a few Indian students, mm -hmm. and they came to the chairman of English and said they'd like a course in Indian literature. So he told them if you can find somebody to teach it, good luck, because nobody knows anything about it. Mm -hmm. So they came to see me, and I didn't know anything about it, but I said I'd, I'd work on it if they had patience, and we'd, I'd try to stay a week ahead of them. And <laughs> we'd make up some kind of course. Uh -huh. That was in about 1969 or so, mm -hmm. and uh, I think it was the first one of the country. Right. I, I know it got picked up by the Norman Transcript, and eventually in the New York Times, they had oh, really? saying this was the first course in literature as literature rather than anthropology. Uh -huh. What did you teach in that class? I taught House Made at Dawn, which had just come out. Mm -hmm. I and won the Pulitzer that year. Yes, it did. Uh -huh. And I taught uh, Winter in the Blood, which was a portion of it had been published in the South Dakota Review, but it wasn't out of this book. I see. And I taught Wakonta, uh, John Joseph Matthews' novel from the 30s, uh -huh. and a lot of poetry from Aquasostini notes. Mm -hmm. I was scrambling. There wasn't really a lot out at the time. I was going to say, it must have taken no small amount of digging to populate That's a, what it mostly was, yeah, 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 trying to find what we could. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. Um, well, it, I imagine that Mama Day had a pretty significant influence. Very. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. So in 68, House Made of Dawn came out. 69, it won the Pulitzer. And you spent no little time studying uh, House Made of Dawn since. Yes, I've taught it, I think, more than I've taught anything else. I must have taught it you know, 30, 40 times in one context or another. Mm -hmm. What sort of impact do you think that that book had on American Indian literature in general? I think it had a massive impact. That... Um, for one thing, it kicked off what later came to be known in the in the 80s as the American Indian Renaissance. Mm -hmm. Before that, House Made of Dawn, there were nine novels in English by American Indian authors. Now there are hundreds, mm -hmm. and it's after House Made of Dawn won the Pulitzer, Viking and Harper's went out looking for Indian writers, mm -hmm. and they signed up um, writers like Soko and um, James Welch. Right. And uh, pretty soon, uh, Welch told me directly that he wanted to be a writer, but he, until Mamadi had success, he didn't think he could. Hmm. So after the success of House Made of Dawn, it was pretty easy for a good Indian writer to get published. I see. Well, it seems like there was a time then when that kind of slacked off, but then, of course, picked back up. And I think it was Sherman Alexie who kind of functioned in that uh, that leadership or that prominent role. Yeah, for but me. It, it's been a pretty steady. I mean, by 1990, I think there were 90 novels, and now it's well over 100. Mm -hmm. But the other thing, it's about is Indian literature 
I don't know if it's un- there are several things unique about it. One is that Indian novelists are often poets, mm-hmm. and there are hardly any other writers who do both in a, of any ethnic group or na- nationality. You know, Henry Ray wrote first and it's terrible. James Joyce wrote first and it's terrible. So either they don't do it or they don't do it well. Uh-huh. But most Indian writers uh, do fiction and poetry. And the other thing is they, they read each other. Mm-hmm. And there's a terrific influence in that sense. Mamadi's Housemaid of Dawn is about um, Abel, a Pueblo winning who comes back from World War II with what we now know as post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm-hmm. Then it didn't have a name, but right. shell shock or something yeah, like that. Yeah, right. I don't think Mamadi calls it anything, but it's clear he had it. Mm-hmm. And of course, he had terrible times adjusting to peacetime. Mm-hmm. Well, so James Welch uh, was very impressed by the novel, and he wrote about an Indian, his nameless, last name is First Race, um, who has a sort of civilian equivalent to post-traumatic stress in him, a, a mm-hmm. malaise, winter in his blood, his, Wells calls it, where he's sort of numb psychologically. And the novel is really given shape by the myth of the wasteland. You know, the one uh-huh. that T.S. Eliot used. And the Fisher King. And, the Fisher King and right. all the business, which ends up with the freeing of the waters. Mm-hmm. It rains and the land blooms. It's been a wasteland. Well, if you don't recognize that, it looks like the book just stops. But actually, it has a climax mm-hmm. when he's sitting in the rain and it's the freeing of the waters. Right. Well, so Leslie Silco writes a book with a Pueblo winning hero, just like Mama Days, mm-hmm. who comes back with PTSD right. and he can't adjust. And the book uses Laguna myths, which are very much like the wasteland myths. Mm-hmm. A wasteland or desert and a uh, freeing of the waters. Well, she uses that. And Mama Day was very impressed by the use of Laguna myth, so he wrote a book, The Ancient Child, mm-hmm. where he used Kiowa myths mm-hmm. about a boy who turns into a bear. Right. And Louise Erdrich has her character, Florid Pillager, turn into a bear. Uh-huh. So you have this, you can see the influence. Right. Um, Lewis Owens wrote a book where he mentioned almost all of those things. It's almost a parody, you know. He has a character in Manteo, who just is a walk-on character. Oh. And, and um, anyway, it's a terrific book, and it tries to weave all those things together. Mm-hmm. I wonder uh, if you have ideas about what it brings about that kind of intertextual conversation. What, um, what seems to be compelling people to be in conversation in that sort of way, do you think? Well, I think they feel a, a kinship as Indian writers, mm-hmm. and they deal with the same themes, and they read each other's work. And you know, some people, some movements are the type of movements where people get together in a room and write a manifesto, like surrealism. Some movements like Romanticism, the poets don't even know they're a group until 50 years later, <laughs> yeah. some professor says Wordsworth and Coleridge and Shelley were romantics. Mm-hmm. Well, Indian writers may not have issued a manifesto, but they're a self-conscious group. Right. And they read each other's works and take them seriously and enter the conversation. Mm-hmm. Hmm. And I imagine uh, we spoke with Gary Hobson not long ago, and he talked about the Returning the Gift conference, where in yes. fact, you know, he's bringing a whole pile of Indian writers together. I, yes, literally kind of getting them together. Right, right. Um, well, I'm wondering about Oklahoma as a place. Now, Oklahoma doesn't figure that prominently in House Made of Dawn. It, there are some spots where it shows up here and there. Yes. Um, but I wonder if you think uh, that Oklahoma plays a particularly significant role somehow, or writers coming out of Oklahoma. Well, yeah, first of all, um, 
the way to write in the mountain is not on the bottom. Mm -hmm. And second of all, the ancient child, Mamre's second novel is an Oklahoma book. Mm -hmm. Part takes us in San Francisco, but the, the important part takes place around Anadarko. Right. And the names, too, of course, is. And the names, of course. Well, that's more about New Mexico, but there's an Oklahoma section here. Right. Well, and two, uh, and I, I had hoped we could talk to Gary about this a little bit, but didn't get much of a chance. But in many ways, um, o American Indian literature kind of grows out of Oklahoma. We, an awful lot of Oklahoma writers. Yeah. Uh, we, we mentioned, um, I think, uh, John Rollin Ridge's uh, first novel, as far as we know, even though it doesn't have a lot to do either with Oklahoma or with Indians. Yellowbird. Uh -huh. uh, Yellowbird. John Rollin Ridge, uh, the Joaquin Murrieta book. Yeah, right. Uh, then, too, we've got um, Alice Callahan's Wainema. Uh, yeah. And, and Will Rogers, uh, who we'll be reading a little bit of. Yes. You know, people from the rest of the country, if we ask them what ethnic group was Will Rogers, they have no idea. But he called himself the Cherokee Kid. Mm -hmm. he, he had very much an Indian identity. Right. Uh, the fact that people in New York were ignorant of it, I don't think, makes a difference. Yeah, <laughs> certainly not to folks around here either, right? Who uh, who know full well that he was Cherokee. Sure. I think. Yeah.